Hi, my name is Aliza Norwood. I'm a primary care internist and HIV specialist located in Austin, where I am the medical director at Vivent Health, a patient-centered medical home for people living with HIV. I'm also a consultant to the South Central AIDS Education and Training Center with a specific focus on gender-affirming care and LGBTQ plus issues. I am the chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at UT Austin Dell Medical School. Uh, and today I'll be presenting on past and current political landscape as it relates to the LGBTQ population and people living with HIV. The views I express in this presentation are my own. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So I'm going to start this talk with the concept of intersectionality to set the framework. Um, first, please note that when I use the term LGBTQ, I am including in that umbrella term intersex, asexual, and queer identified people, um, even if I don't say the plus at the end. So the Oxford, the Oxford Dictionary defines intersectionality as the interconnected nature of social categorizations, such as race, class, and gender, as they apply to a given individual or group. Um, regarded as creating overlapping or interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. As I mentioned earlier, I was asked to talk about LGBTQ policies and current events and their impact on people living with HIV. So although there are not many laws that explicitly legislate against LGBTQ people li living with HIV all together as one group, there is a ripple effect that anti-LGBTQ policies have on many different communities. Um, so that stigma against one group is perpetuated in another and so on. It's true that all of us have multiple aspects of our identities that are interconnected um, and that represent this intersectionality um, and they may belong in different communities. So in this talk, I'll discuss specifically how policies or laws that attack a person's gender identity or their sexual orientation can impact HIV prevention and care, and how laws, vice versa, that criminalize HIV disproportionately impact the LGBTQ community. With that in mind, my objectives for this talk are as follows. First, I wanna illustrate how anti-LGBTQ laws impact people living with HIV. And again, vice versa, how laws that criminalize HIV disproportionately impact people in the LGBTQ population. I'll discuss HIV criminalization history in the US with a particular focus on Texas. Um, we'll identify some recent anti-LGBTQ laws, um, and I'll focus a bit on those proposed in the recent 2021 Texas legislature and touch on some national trends as well. Uh, and we'll discuss their potential impact on HIV, health and, well, uh, health and well-being for people living with HIV. And then finally, I'll briefly touch on ways that um, we as clinicians can promote policies that improve health and wellness for LGBTQ identified people and people living with HIV. So bias and discrimination against LGBTQ people, especially when it's codified into law, results in coping mechanisms and survival tactics that then increase risk of HIV acquisition. And this is one of the ways in which these stigmatizing or anti-LGBTQ laws can actually um, in, uh, curtail our ability to prevent HIV or care for people living with HIV and have negative consequences. For example, in the face of persistent employment discrimination, many transgender women are left with few other options but to engage in survival sex work, and this has been shown through research um, in order to meet some basic needs. Um, for example, according to a 2015 survey of more than 27,000 transgender people, um, I'm quoting from the report, the rate of HIV diagnosis was five times higher among those who have participated in sex work at any point in their lifetime than among those who have not. And again, when you are barred from engaging in social society or, or uh, getting employment, not having a driver's license um, that reflects your gender identity, all of these different things, it makes it more difficult um, to get work. Um, and then you may be pushed to, towards these other ways of getting money uh, for survival. Anti-LGBTQ bias contributes also to the HIV epidemic in part by discouraging testing and treatment for HIV. There is a fear of being outed or a fear of being harassed, 
There's also decreased access to that kind of testing and treatment. Um, uh, I can share from personal experience in my clinic. Um, you know, I used to work at uh, David Powell, um, uh, which is uh, one of our uh, community care clinics here. Community care is one of our largest federally qualified health centers in central Texas. Um, and David Powell has a back entrance um, that is not visible from the street. Um, and that was intentional because a lot of people do not want to be seen going into the building. A lot of people would sometimes skip appointments because they did not want to be seen going into a clinic. So that's just one kind of vivid example of how um, stigma and discrimination uh, can really impact care for people living with HIV. Um, at the clinic I work at now, if I've been health, patients continue to express concern over being seen in the clinic. Um, I've heard stories of patients who are breastfeeding um, here and in other countries um, with high stigma um, uh, deciding um, to breastfeed, um, even giving the potential risk of uh, exposing a, a newborn to HIV um, because not breastfeeding would potentially label them as having HIV. So these are all just different ways in which um, people's decisions are influenced by bias um, and that can impact their care. HIV disproportionately impacts the LGBTQ population um, <clears throat> and particularly men who have sex with men and trans women. So again, LGBTQ is a very broad umbrella term and each group represented in that acronym is both unique and diverse um, and must be considered apart from the rest of the LGBTQ community. Um, so I am referring to LGBTQ population throughout this talk when I talk about policies that are often broadly written, uh, for example, anti-discrimination laws. Uh, but this is an important point to please know that each community, again, within that population has its own concerns and characteristics and varied experiences within that community. Um, and so I'll highlight a, a couple of differences here, but um, uh, we also must recognize that the impact of HIV on groups within the LGBTQ population like trans men or intersex individuals are not fully known because of a lack of research and a lack of data collection on sexual orientation, gender identity, and even recognition of intersex persons. Um, so take all of this with a big grain of salt, um, but we do have research that shows um, a uh, disproportionate impact, particularly on transgender women and uh, men who have sex with men um, who may or may not identify as gay or bisexual. Also, people who identify as Hispanic or Latina or Latinx uh, or African American or Black have higher incidence of new HIV infections in the United States. Um, and that's due to the myriad effects of systemic racism. Um, a, a systemic racism is a term that refers to deeply embedded racism in the fabric of our society, laws, healthcare, education, and economy. Um, so when we talk about laws that criminalize HIV, um, which I'm about to get into, um, we need to also recognize that those laws have outsized impacts on the LGBTQ population and um, that there is a racial disparity um, in who is impacted by those laws as well. So let's start with a history of HIV criminalization in the United States. As of 2022, 35 states have laws that make it a crime for a person living with HIV to expose another person to HIV. I'll explain on the next slide what kinds of actions that can include per these laws. Um, but this was actually pretty surprising to me in putting together this talk. There have been many states that have uh, modernized their laws um, since uh, the first discovery of HIV, but some of them, as you'll see, are still woefully outdated um, when you compare it to our current scientific knowledge of HIV and how it's spread. So in Texas, prior to 1994, um, there was an HIV transmission statute that made it a third degree felony punishable by up to 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine for a person living with HIV to, quote, intentionally and without consent transfer bodily fluids to another. In 1994, Texas actually became the first state to repeal its HIV criminalization laws. Uh, again, many state laws are now outdated and don't reflect our current understanding of HIV. Uh, and in many cases, the same standard is not applied to other treatable diseases. Um, 
Further, these laws have been shown to increase stigma, exacerbate disparities, and may discourage HIV testing. As you can see in the figure to the left on the screen, um, Texas is in blue, which indicates that it is one of the only 13 states that currently does not criminalize actions through HIV or STD-specific statutes. However, even though uh, it is not, uh, there is no criminalization statute on the books in Texas, that repeal did not stop prosecutions. So Texas courts have repeatedly found that the bodily fluid of a person living with HIV is considered a deadly weapon, even if no intent to infect a person is there um, or there is no scientifically reasonable risk of infection. So again, even though it's not explicitly criminalized, courts can find that uh, a person's bodily fluids are a deadly weapon and therefore uh, the punishment goes up uh, in, those, in those cases. People living with HIV have been prosecuted for um, exposing others to their bodily fluids, um, again, even if they engage in activities that pose no risk of HIV transmission. For example, courts have found defendants guilty. Um, this is in Texas, but um, we have examples all across the nation. If uh, a person living with HIV's saliva or other bodily fluids um, were involved, um, and uh, one example in 2014 um, was an 18 year old uh, living with HIV was sentenced to 70 years in prison for performing oral sex on a 15 year old without uh, disclosing his HIV status um, and that sentence um, was uh, much more severe because of his status uh, as someone living with HIV even though there was no significant risk of exposure um, with that act. So this graph shows a bit more detail about the kinds of actions that are identified in these laws that criminalize behavior of people living with HIV. And this is national, uh, the national laws. So as you can see, there, there are listed on here actions like spitting um, that can be criminalized, um, even though uh, you know, the CDC says that there is no um, significant risk of exposure from saliva. Um, again, in the last 10 years, some states have amended their laws, um, to, uh, like removing HIV prevention issues from the criminal code and including them under disease control regulations instead of, of criminal um, statutes, um, or some of the laws now require an intent to transmit um, as part of the crime, um, or having an actual HIV, tr HIV transmission occur in order to prosecute. Um, or um, allowing defenses such as um, taking being uh, virally suppressed or being non-infectious um, through part uh, through prep use or um, partner prep use or condom use. Um, those are some of the amendments that have been added to some of these laws. Uh, I want to also point out that there's um, some medical expert complicity um, in this. So court cases have relied on the testimony of medical experts that there exists a theoretical possibility of HIV transmission through saliva, even though, again, scientifically, um, that has not uh, been borne out. So now I'm going to talk about LGBTQ laws and policies, uh, ones that are not HIV specific. This map shows a ranking of each state uh, regarding its LGBTQ laws and policies. Um, more orange to red means more negative laws or more discriminatory laws. Uh, the major categories of laws represented here are relationships and parental recognition, um, like marriage, ability to adopt children, um, if you are uh, LGBTQ, um, non-discrimination clauses, religious exemptions, LGBTQ youth, healthcare, criminal justice, and identity documents. So as you can see, Texas is in the low overall policy tally. Um, so not very positive when we look at um, these laws and policies. And the whole Southeast uh, is, is pretty negative. When we look specifically at insurance non-discrimination laws, um, we can see that only 15 states um, and Puerto Rico and DC have laws that prohibit uh, private health insurance from discriminating based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so that's the majority of states that, um, that allow insurance um, companies to potentially discriminate. 
Um, and if you look at uh, where people are living, uh, 44% of uh, the US LGBTQ population lives in states that don't have LGBTQ inclusive insurance protections. When we look at religious exemption laws, seven states have targeted religious exemptions that permit medical professionals to decline to serve LGBTQ clients or patients. Um, those include Illinois, Ohio, Tennessee, South Carolina, um, Arizona, um, Alabama, and uh, Mississippi. So I'm going to talk a little bit about religious exemption bills um, because this is something that's been in the news lately. So religious exemption bills allow medical professionals uh, to deny services if they violate their personally held religious beliefs. In the last legislative session, this came up. Came up. Um, HB 1424 almost made it through the House, um, which would have allowed medical professionals to deny services. Um, it uh, did not make it, but is likely to come back next session. So we should see this again. Um, and it specifically would allow any hospital employee to deny services if they violate their ethical, moral, or religious beliefs. Um, so that could include um, uh, providing PrEP, for example, or caring for somebody who identified as transgender, um, etc. cetera. Um, also, um, uh, on September 7th, 2022, um, a federal judge in Texas um, ruled in favor of a management company that argued in its initial complaint that the Affordable Care Act's requirement that insurers and employers offer plans that cover PrEP for free because it is a grade A recommendation from the USPSTF, uh, the US uh, Preventive Services Task Force. Um, they complained that that forces, and this is a quote, forces religious employers to provide coverage for drugs that facilitate and encourage homosexual behavior, prostitution, sexual promiscuity, and IV drug use. Um, and the judge ruled in favor of that company, so they, they did not have to um, cover PrEP um, for these reasons, uh, which has real implications for HIV prevention um, and HIV incidence here in Texas, which is already high. Um, uh, we have some of the highest burden um, in Texas and in the county that I am in, in Travis, uh, in the nation. Um, and this is expected to be uh, appealed by the federal government, um, but we will have to see. So how does this impact HIV care? I mean, it's, I think it's pretty obvious, but I want to also talk about the ripple effect that this can have. The Southern LGBT Health Survey um, conducted in November 2019 found that a high proportion of people who identify within the LGBTQ spectrum report feeling uncomfortable seeking medical care. This is in 2019. And so the more and more you have um, you know, legal allowances for medical professionals to overtly discriminate, the more we're going to see this. Um, so you'll see in the figure on the left the proportions of people who said that they never or rarely or sometimes feel comfortable seeking medical care. And you'll also note that transgender people felt even less comfortable than cisgender LGBTQ people or LGBTQ people, um, with only 30% of them saying that they always or often felt comfortable seeking medical care. Um, so there is a higher burden um, in that community. A 2014 Kaiser Family Foundation survey of gay and bisexual identified men in the U.S. found that 15% of them reported receiving uh, poor treatment from, from a medical professional as a result of their sexual orientation, and at least 30% uh, didn't feel comfortable discussing sexual behavior with a healthcare provider. Now we have a recommendation from the CDC that every primary care doctor should be discussing PrEP with anybody who is engaging in uh, sexual activity um, that could lead to an STD. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a real problem. If people don't feel comfortable talking about um, their sexual practices, uh, we're gonna miss a lot of opportunities to get uh, people on PrEP, which is one of the most highly effective medications that has ever been developed, um, you know, for infectious disease and for, you know, medicine in general. So what about Texas specifically? Um, so again, if we, if we break it down, um, you know, 
not great in terms of sexual orientation policies um, or gender identity policies. Um, so uh, pretty negative policy tally um, that we see and um, that has uh, implications um, for all of the things I was talking about related to HIV prevention and care. Um, there were approximately 30 anti-LGBTQ bills filed in uh, the Texas legislature last session. Um, all were defeated, uh, but after that general session, three subsequent special sessions were called. Um, so a total of 76 anti-LGBTQ um, bills were filed, um, and some did make it through. Um, these bills included religious exemption bills, um, laws to prohibit minors from amending their birth certificates to match their gender identity, uh, bans on transgender youth participating in school sports, which did eventually pass in a special session, um, HIV criminalization, uh, state preemption of uh, local city or county non-discrimination non ordinances, uh, so the state saying um, that cities and counties could not make their own non-discrimination ordinances. Uh, and then, of course, which has been in the news a lot, bans on gender-affirming medical care for trans youth. Um, so we have some studies that look on the actual impact of HIV care from some of these types of policies. Um, a 2017 study by Reisner et al. found that transgender youth were more likely to miss their HIV care appointments if they were treated negatively because of their gender identity. Um, and a later study in 2019 found that unmet needs for gender affirmation, um, which could be taken away by these laws, um, uh, were significantly associated with HIV treatment interruptions. And of course, uh, people may just avoid doctor's offices altogether. There were some pro-LGBTQ bills, um, both nationally and uh, in Texas. Some of the examples of those um, are listed here on the slide. Um, facilitating gender marker changes, banning conversion therapy, updating the James Beard um, Jr. Hate Crimes Act. Unfortunately, all of these died in the House, uh, except for two that, that went on to the Senate, um, those uh, banning, con sorry, banning conversion therapy uh, and the right to marry for same-sex couples and state statutes, uh, but they did not pass into law. Um, and finally, I want to draw attention to uh, the second to last bullet point about these uh, Romeo-Juliet laws. Um, those, uh, that law states that anyone between the ages of 14 and 17 can legally give consent to have sex with somebody within three years of their age, but only if they are of the opposite sex. And that's still on the books. So very explicitly anti-LGBTQ for, for teens. Uh, so existing laws offer no protections for teens who are dating someone of the same sex um, in that category. Um, and just to note, in, in 2005, uh, the Kansas Supreme Court ruled that a similar law in that state violated the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution, and they got rid of it, um, but we have not here in Texas. So given that we know that there is a link between anti-LGBTQ laws and policies and a negative impact on HIV prevention and on HIV treatment, what can we as clinicians do? Um, how can we help our patients? So I would say that intersectionality really mandates that we prevent and treat HIV by caring for people in a status neutral system. And what that means is, or what I mean that by that, is that we really as HIV care providers need to be thinking about um, people at all stages of their life um, and in an HIV status neutral way so that we offer, say, gender affirming care um, for all patients, uh, not just those on PrEP, not just those who are living with HIV, um, but so we give the full spectrum of LGBTQ care because we know that that population is um, disproportionately impacted. So I would say more ability to provide uh, these really gender affirming care um, in safe spaces, um, affirming primary care. Everybody should have a, a primary care physician uh, who is affirming um, uh, if somebody is LGBTQ regardless of their HIV status. 
Uh, and then we need to really ramp up mobile HIV testing and prevention services so that we can get to people no matter where they are so that they don't have to necessarily go to a doctor's office, which again, might be scary given um, you know these religious exemption laws and, and other, other things that may be in the news that turn people off from tr traditional uh, settings for medical care. So we really need to start thinking outside the box to be able to serve people. What else can clinicians do? So I think as individuals, um, we may not, for example, be able to speak on behalf of our organization, but as individual physicians, um, you know, we are experts in this area. Um, and I say physicians, I also mean clinicians in general. Um, we can write op-eds. Um, we do have um, authority um, as experts to speak on, on many of these policies um, that uh, would impact our patients. We can write position papers um, uh, and uh, you know, give those to legislators um, uh, to show kind of with a coordinated effort. Those are usually written by um, many clinicians um, or a, uh, a medical professional body. Um, uh, to give an opinion on a particular policy. Um, you can go and talk to your legislators. I'm here in Austin, and so that's great access to our capital. Um, you can also you know, travel to the capital, um, and I think there may be more and more Zoom options now uh, post-COVID um, or as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and then finally, joining local, regional, or national medical societies um, to amplify your voice. Um, and so I'll just speak about this, this first idea, um, which is writing op-eds, because um, I have a bit of experience in that. So um, some general thoughts on op-ed writing and how to um, make an impact in that space. Um, I think the key to op-ed writing is, is to take your area of expertise and make it relevant to the public. Um, so one way to do this is to think about a triangle of impact. And by that, I mean, think about the epicenter of your expertise. Um, say that you're an expert in HIV um, and you're also a primary care doctor. Um, think about the multiple aspects of who you are and how they contribute to your expertise. Um, if you're a medical director, say that. If you've been working in HIV for 10, 20 years, say that. Um, if you are a person living with HIV, uh, talk about that. Um, show how there are different aspects of who you are um, that make you an expert on this particular topic. So that's important in order to establish why somebody should listen to you. Um, and then how can you use that expertise to import to people um, that this is something that um, they should pay attention to? Well, the best way to do that is to think of three related topics or a triangle of impact um, that are more generalizable and relatable to the general public. And you also want to talk about the relevance. Um, so usually being able to identify something that is current in the news cycle um, so that there's a news hook that you can kind of tie into um, is very helpful um, to keep people's attention. I'm going to give one example uh, that I had mentioned previously of a recent news story. So as I mentioned, in September of this year, um, 2022, uh, a Texas uh, U.S. District Court judge railed, uh, ruled in favor of a corporation uh, which argued that um, PrEP forces uh, religious employers to provide coverage for drugs that they are religiously or morally opposed to. Um, so this ruling, I would say, is both anti-LGBTQ and has the potential to significantly decrease access to highly effective HIV prevention medications. Um, so in writing this op-ed, um, what I did was first establish that I was an expert on HIV prevention and PrEP. Um, I work in an HIV treatment and prevention clinic. I see many patients on PrEP. I work in a county with a high number of new HIV diagnoses, one of the 50 um, highest priority counties uh, in the U.S., according to the CDC and the uh, Ending the Epidemic uh, Initiative. Then I touched on three related but distinct topics. Um, and those are, um, uh, although this targets PrEP coverage, uh, this is also about getting rid of a very cost-effective medication, or not getting rid of, but decreasing access to a very cost-effective medication 
which can then drive up healthcare costs. So that's more broadly um, uh, applicable to people and something that may um, make it more obvious why they should care about that. Um, so tying it into cost effectiveness overall. Um, when I talk about HIV prevention, um, it's true that um, this will have a profound uh, you know, impact on uh, new HIV diagnoses and it undermines HIV prevention work. Uh, but it's also a slippery slope toward the erosion of ACA coverage for preventive medicine tools in general, uh, like colon cancer screening, um, things that have, again, broad applicability to the public. So when we take away very effective, you know, USPSTF, um, highly rated uh, preventive tools, um, we're going to erode our primary care infrastructure and preventive care infrastructure, and that's going to lead to morbidity and mortality for many people, not just people who would use PrEP. And then finally, this is an example of uh, anti-LGBTQ stigma, um, but uh, we can tie that into how you know stigma in healthcare exists and hurts many people, and how um, really uh, stigma against LGBTQ people is being used in this way um, to save employers money. Um, and so I think that, again, is something that can resonate uh, with more people. So my take home points for this talk um, are that many states still criminalize HIV. There are harsher penalties um, because um, of HIV status, um, and those happen without explicit HIV criminalization laws. Um, there are record numbers of anti-LGBTQ laws across the U.S. that threaten people living with HIV, um, and that to end the HIV epidemic, um, public health, criminal justice, and legislative systems must work together to ensure that laws protect the community, are evidence-based and just, and support public health efforts. Um, these are my references, and thank you very much for your time.